All right, so Revelation 2, 1 through 3. Good reason for splitting this, and I'll show you as we go. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this passage of scripture. Uh, we thank you for your word uh, as a whole. I ask that you use it to impact. You have promised that your word would not return void. And uh, I pray that as we go through part of the history and uh, a little bit of the truth that you've revealed to us through the Bible here, I, I pray that it would impact hearts in a way that uh, need to be uh, just hit. And uh, Father, I pray that people would understand with a greater understanding today of what you required of us. I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> As we get started today, um, I want you to consider a few questions. I, and the reason that I'm doing it this way, and you can verbalize if you want to, I really don't mind. It doesn't bother me. But the reason I'm doing this is to give you a sense of what's going on in our passage of Scripture. I want you to get that feel for it, that flow as I go through. So think about these questions and know that these are directly placed on top of what we're looking at in Revelation 2, 1 through 3. Okay, so the church at Ephesus, I'm trying to give you that feel as I go through these questions. Have you ever been working at your computer and it kept glitching? And although it worked, you knew that something wasn't right. Has anybody ever been in that situation? You're on that crazy machine with a couple of wires in it, and it's working, but not quite right. I took my Cadillac in this past Friday, and the guy looked at me and did this. And I cried a little bit. But um, so I actually had my son's laptop to be able to finish what I have today. Uh, have you ever been driving a car, but as you drove it, and this is technical, it went clunk, 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 but kept driving, and you knew that something wasn't right, but it was still moving. Has anybody ever been there with a car? <laughs> yeah, yeah. If, uh, I, I've never known a new car other than one that we had totaled, so I knew that quite often. Have you ever ordered food? Sat down and you're eating it and something just doesn't taste right. But you kept eating it anyways, didn't you? You finished it and then you felt it later. Has anybody been in that situation? Have you ever, and this is one of my favorites, have you ever entered the room of a happily married couple? I mean, these are the saints, Right? I mean, these people are together. They love the Lord. They've always got a positive word to say. But you come in the room and something's off. Now, they're still together. But you know that things aren't quite the way that they should be. Has anybody ever seen that one? Okay. <laughs> Somebody said yesterday. <laughs> Have you ever turned in a test? Or final exam. And as you're walking up there, you're like, man, I know that I missed it. I got a lot of this right, but there's some of it. It's just not quite what it should be. I had one time at Clemson where I did this literally in a class after a math test. The fourth time, third time I had taken the class. And walked out the door. Because I knew it was over. This is probably one that meets you eye to eye. Have you ever walked into the doctor's office? 
He got inside the doctor's office. They did every test that they could possibly do. I mean, they ran MRIs, did CAT scans. They took your blood five times. And when they were done, they said, man, ma'am, you're in perfect health. But when you walked out of that door, you knew something wasn't quite right. I think we've all been there if you've been on this planet long enough. In life, there are many things that appear to be working, but they're not functioning correctly. That's the picture of the church at Ephesus and many other believing assemblies that followed throughout the church age. Remember, every church that we cover in Rev Revelation is representative of the churches that have come after them. At least they've been the same or some combination of the other six. But these are representative churches. They were real churches, but they also represent the churches that have come throughout time. And this church had some problems like most churches out there. Our passage for today reveals what happens when a body of believers attempt to serve the Lord without love. And I will bet you, because we're not going to get into it today, which is going to hurt some of you. I will bet you that there are some preconceived notions when it comes to love that do not align with Scripture. And I'll prove that within the next week. <clears throat> so what happens when a church attempts to serve the Lord without love? The answer to that question is the primary point of my message today. How can a church serve the Lord without love? What happens when that takes place? Well, the answer is Jesus removes the loveless church. He takes it out. Jesus removes the loveless church. Obviously, that hadn't happened yet because John was instructed to warn these people. In verse 1, it says, To the angel of the church of Ephesus writes, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. That is verse 1. As we've seen, the angel mentioned here is really a pastor or it's a church leader of sorts within a local congregation. We're not going to nail it down. We, we know it's not a heavenly being. If you need to go back and look at uh, the sermons out of chapter 1, then you can get that. We know it's not a heavenly being. This is a human being within a local congregation. I'm not going to specify and say it's just a pastor. That's caused confusion over the years. Because in these churches, there were multiple pastors. There were groups of elders that helped to rule the church, and they did it alongside one another. So, so this was a elder, a leader within the church that had received this message. The pastor, or the elder, symbolically referred to as a star in the first chapter, is one that dispels darkness. That's the reason that he is doing that. Anytime you preach the word, light comes. That's why he's a star. This is simple, symbolic understanding. If you sat there and processed through, you'd come to much the same conclusion. He also said that those pastors were held in his right hand. That depicts sovereign use of the Lord. Jesus is holding these pastors. Those seven stars are in his right hand. That means he's going to use them. He's just not sitting there holding them. It's meant to show you that they are going to be used within the churches to pass on the word of God. <clears throat> in Revelation 1.13, the Son of Man is pictured standing in the midst of seven lampstands, which are the seven churches. There he's seen as a prophet, as a priest, and as a king. And simply put, he oversees the churches there. However, in verse 1, he's walking. And get this, he's moved from standing to walking. He's standing with them. Here the intention is that the readers see him as active among the churches. Doesn't that just make sense? He's gone from standing to walking. He doesn't just provide oversight. 
It's the way a lot of people look at it. He's not just providing oversight, but works among them to glorify himself and bring about the sanctification of the church. This is God saying, I see where you're at, but we're not going to leave you in that place. We're going to take you further in holiness. We're going to grow you, right? You can't be stagnant and be a Christian. God will not allow it with his people. The Lord initially directed John to write to the church at Ephesus. And they were first on the list that we're looking at here. And you go back through your scriptures in chapter 1, it gives a list of the churches. For the next few minutes, I'm going to attempt to give you an idea of what life was like in Ephesus. You've got to understand this. It, it is poor when you've got the history and yet you don't use it. It helps to explain why they were in the situation that they were in, what they were going through. You don't have the history, you don't have an understanding. Now, I want you to know this. The history that I'm pulling is straight out of Barclay. Now, commentary, so you say, this is not me just going to ancient sources and looking them up and bringing these out. These are commentaries. Barclay was one, Warren Wearsby was one, Vincent was one, and MacArthur was one. I cobbled these together, and I'm going to give you the history at the church of Ephesus. It's not that long, but I want you to understand what was happening during their day and what led to this letter being written around 95 AD. Okay? <clears throat> As you've already heard, it was the first, the church of Ephesus was the first on the postal route because it was the most prominent church of the seven. It was the closest one from the Isle of Patmos as well. It was the mother church out of which the other six were born. What you heard Pastor Aaron read this morning in Acts chapter 19 verse 10 and it was also the city where the Ephesian letter was penned four decades earlier by the Apostle Paul. <coughs> Sorry, it's getting me this morning. If you'll look back at my sermons throughout the history of First Baptist, you know I cough throughout. So, if it alleviates any fears. <coughs> Ephesus was considered to be the most prominent city in Asia Minor. Its population in the New Testament has been estimated between 250,000 and 500,000 people. The city's theater is still visible today into which the frenzied rioters dragged Paul's companion Gaius and Aristarchus, and that's uh, Acts 19.29, held an estimated 25,000 people in their Colosseum area, 25,000 people. Do you imagine what an ancient feat it was to build something that enormous? 25,000 people. <clears throat> Ephesus was also considered a free city. It was self-governing, which means the Roman Empire wasn't pressing them to do certain things. They were allowed to rule within their city limits the way that they wanted to. The city also ho hosted athletic events rivaling our athletic Olympic events that we see today. And during its day, Ephesus was the primary harbor in the province of Asia. By law, incoming Roman governors every time had to enter through Ephesus. It was mandated by the Roman government that they come in through that way. The city was located on the Castor River, about three miles upriver from where it flowed into the sea. Those disembarking at the harbor traveled along this magnificent, and as you see in the picture there, wide column line road called the Arcadian Way. So every time they come in, if you were a governor, you had to go through this column lined way where you were checking in, kind of. It led to the center of the city, and that day... Silt deposited by the Castor River was slowly filling up the harbor, forcing the city to keep trying to keep the channel opening. They, they were working to make sure that it didn't close up because of all the silt that was coming in. That battle was ultimately going to be lost, and the city had to move six miles inland. <clears throat> Ephesus was strategically located at the junction of the four most important roads in Asia Minor. That along with its harbor prompted the 
geographer Strabo, he was a contemporary of Christ. The geographer Strabo, he said to describe it as Ephesus, a market in Asia, a great market in Asia. Laying aside all the accolades, Ephesus was the most famous center of worship of the goddess Artemis or Diana. It was a point of great civic pride. You can go back and look at Acts 19, 27, and 35. The temple of Artemis was Ephesus' most prominent landmark because its inner shrine was supposedly sacrosanct. The temple served as one of the most important banks in the Mediterranean world. The temple and the surrounding areas also provided sanctuary for criminals, and you're going to see why in just a second. Further, the sale of items used in worship of Artemis provided an important source of income for the inner city. That's Acts 19.24. Every spring, a month-long festival, lasting a month, month-long festival was used to honor the goddess, complete with athletic games, dramatic performances, and even musical events. The worship of Artemis was unspeakably vile. Her idol was a gross, multi-breasted monstrosity, popularly believed to have fallen from heaven. That's Acts 19.35. The temple was attended by numerous priests, eunuchs, and slaves. Thousands of priestesses, who were little more than ritual prostitutes, played a major role in the worship of Artemis. The temple grounds were a chaotic cacophony of priests, prostitutes, bankers, criminals, musicians, dancers, and frenzied hysterical worshipers. Seeing all that was taking place during that day, the philosopher Heraclitus became known as the weeping philosopher because no one, he declared, could live in Ephesus, in Ephesus and not weep over all of its immorality. It was in that environment, it was in that terrible environment that the church existed. The atmosphere was toxic and the local body wasn't ministering to others the way that they should, which is why Jesus issued the warning that's given in verse 4 that we're not going to get to today. But that's why the warning came out. It was a bad, bad place to live. Folks, this is further removed than what we're dealing with today. And people are talking about how bad it is. And I agree that things are getting worse. I think you've got your eyes closed if you think our society is getting better. As the restraints are moved, the chaos continues. It grows. <clears throat> From the world's perspective, the church outwardly seemed to be functioning, functioning as God desired. It should be noted that several of their actions were pleasing to him. In verse 2, the Son of Man said, I know your works. This is verse 2. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. Here, part of what the Lord knows about the assembly is being revealed. The Greek tells us that he doesn't just know, but he knows absolutely. So when it says, I know, when the Lord says, I know, he's saying, I know completely. I know comprehensively what's going on. There's nothing I miss. You say, well, it's the Lord. Of course, that's the way that it is. But I want you to understand that his saying, I know, it wasn't as if he had just learned it. Of course, Jesus hadn't just learned who they were and what they were about. But at that time, he presented what he knew was about to come in their lives. He was telling them, I know that this is coming next for you. I also see where you're at right now. Jesus started by stating who they were day in and day out. <clears throat> First, he recognizes their works. This term seems to be a broad category. If you see the word works in verse 2, it represents a broad category under which the following attributes are going to fit. Works pertain to their deeds in general and is followed by what they typically did. 
So you see works, and then everything that follows comes under that category. First, the Lord tells us that their labors were acceptable works. That means that they toiled unto the point of exhaustion. The Greek term comes from a root word that means they were cut and thereby weakened. I want you to think about this before we move out of it. We're dealing with the labors here. Right now, if someone were to show up and they were to cut the wrist, have a bad wound on them, they might begin to bleed. And for a few minutes, you would think that everything was fine, although the pain and blood would say otherwise. If they hit the right vein, the right artery, whatever it would be, and the blood continued to issue forth, what would eventually happen to them? Well, you say they die, but they'd get weak. And so when you're looking at the term labor here, actually what it means is they had labored to the point of exhaustion like a person that had been cut and got weak. That's what, you, that's what they want you to understand. When a person gets to that point in their labor, they can no longer do, Right? And many of you medical professionals understand what I'm talking about. If someone loses that much blood, they can no longer function. And this is what's going on. The Lord said, I'm watching you. I see you laboring. And I know you're laboring to the point of exhaustion where you cannot move anymore. This is a positive thing that he's saying about them. They gave all that they had physically, spiritually, and emotionally. They were like farmers who had planted and watered and harvested and given everything that they could at the end of the season they sit down and they're like oh my goodness this is so taxing on me like many who claim to be a part of the church today these people this is the lord this is the point that he wants you to get they were not sitting idly by while others worked they were going in and these people ephesus was getting their hands dirty. They sought to maintain the existing body and the Lord was honored by the labor that they put forth. And second, Jesus noted their work of patience. I tell you Greek terms because I want you to understand really where all of the uh, background and root of what Jesus was saying to them was coming from. So hupomone literally means to abide under or to stay behind. Hupomone. The Lord noted their work of patience. That's what that is. When you read about this church, most forget all that was right in light of what was wrong. As you get to verse 4, most people go through this passage and they attack love. They were a loveless church. Let's stay here. But Jesus is saying there's some things that they did really good. Amen? He said they were demonstrating patience. Now that you understand what the cultural climate was like, you can understand why this was such a big deal. James tells us that patience perfects Christian character. That's James 1.4. Paul states that Fellowship and patience with Christ is the marker that believers share. It's the marker that believers have who will reign with them, 2 Timothy 2.12. When patience manifests, we're even told in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16, in Colossians 1.11, that God strengthens us with all power, making it possible. So if you have patience, who's giving it to you? God. Patience is the blessed gift of the Spirit. That little church was at the very least patient with one another. Man, that's something, right? Patient with one another in the church? Woo! If he, if he had only said this about this church, it should be camped on and preached about because they were patient with one another. And how were they patient? I don't want you to miss this. They were patient with one another because they abided under the Lord. That's what patience means. You cannot develop godly patience unless you're abiding under him. That's what John was trying to get across. That's what the Holy Spirit inspired here. A patient church 
was there in Ephesus. These people were working with one another. They were doing a lot of good things. Third, the Messiah pointed out their work of godly intolerance. Uh Uh-oh. Their work of godly intolerance. This is completely countercultural to what we know today. The Ephesian church could not bear those who were evil. They could not bear those who were evil. The idea here is, get this, they couldn't remove some that were damaging and worthless and living among them. They couldn't get them out. They couldn't remove them. They couldn't bear those that were evil. Was him saying, was the Lord specifically, literally saying, some of them are evil and we can't do anything to get them out. This is the church saying this. We can't remove them. And this is the Lord acknowledging that. He sees what's happening. As the Lord said during his ministry, there are times when the wheat has to grow with the tares. But eventually, there will come a time when the net will be drug, dragged, however you need to say it. It will be pulled And collect good and bad fish. And at the end of the age, they'll be separated out. So if you want to put those two together. Right now, in the church age, the wheat's growing. But there's tares among the wheat. Amen, somebody? It's the truth. But it's not going to be like that forever. Because Jesus tells us that eventually, they're going to be separated out. And the holy angels are going to do the work. Just know that God is in charge. And if he wanted them gone, then he would have cleared the way. I've seen this too many times. There are times when you cannot deal with people that are malicious. They may be behind the scenes. They may not be doing anything that you can directly point out. But you know, right? You've seen it. You've worked alongside them. They claim to be a Christian, but their actions dictate otherwise. Except that you just can't nail it down. You might have even had a conversation with them. You talk with them about what's going on in their life and what you see. And they'll agree with you, but they continue in that same rut. You can't remove them. But I'll tell you this. As God is my witness, I have seen him take people out of the church that we could do nothing with. He did say, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. And sometimes it falls down to him doing that. To their credit, to the church of Ephesus' credit, they dealt with those individuals in a Christ-like manner, recognizing their evil just as God did. It is right for us to see injustice, for us to see wrong and say, that is wrong. You know, but the problem is, is when we say that is wrong today, and the people hearing us say that is wrong, when that comes across their ears, they say, well, I don't like that you're so mean because you don't agree with me. And anything that doesn't agree with me is mean-spirited and has to be dealt with. Because I can't have you being toxic in my atmosphere. The church of Ephesus was standing up. They said, in our church, we're not dealing with this evil mess. That's who they were. They were intolerant of that evil. And Jesus further commends their works in verses 2 and 3 saying, And you have tested those who say they're apostles and are not, and have found them liars. In verse 3, And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. They continued in what they were doing. Not all of their efforts to remove wickedness failed. The Messiah pointed out that they tested those who called themselves apostles. They were testing the people that called themselves apostles and found them to be liars. That practice was mandated... By the Apostle John in 1 John chapter 4, 1 through 6. I want you to see this because this is not just something that's written in the, in the New Testament in a small letter. It's a direction for us. This is what we're supposed to do. 1 John chapter 4, 1 through 6. This is what he wrote. Beloved, do not believe every spirit. You say, believe every spirit? Is this mystical? What's going on here? Are we going to see ghosts? 
Is that what it's talking about? No, no, no. You know, behind every person is a spirit because you are body, soul, and what? Spirit. And behind that spirit, as we understand Ephesians 6, is a demonic network that influences what's going on. Folks, the reason that people agree on a wholesale effort the way that they do in the United States of America has nothing to do with political parties and everything to do with the satanic power that's behind them. That's where we're losing it. Why is this person thinking this? Why is this person thinking that? The reason that they're thinking and doing that is not just because they are of some political bent. It's because they lost and they need Jesus. That's why. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is already in the world. Now, these are little antichrists here, people who were against the salvation of Christ. Would you say that that is increasing in our world, that Christianity is becoming less favorable? You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are of the world. Therefore, they speak as of the world. And the world hears them. We are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this, we know the spirit of truth. We know the spirit of error. If someone is speaking for God to a believer, it's going to be clear. If you know anything about the scripture and about the word, you're going to go, that's right. I know that because I can go back to the book and verify it. And people that think illogically in this world are being driven by the God of this world, Satan himself. Without getting into too much detail here, the apostles mentioned could have been In two groups, one of two groups. They could have been like the Lord's 12. If you want to go back and look at Acts 126 and on, okay? Like the Lord's 12. If they were going to fall into the apostles like the Lord's, then they had to meet certain qualifications. One of those qualifications that they were there when the Lord was baptized. Big A, capital A, apostle was there when the Lord was baptized, and they were there when he was crucified. But there are also lowercase apostles that are mentioned in the book of Acts, and this is very important in other places in Scripture, like what we see here. And these people were certainly those that were sent out. To simply put it, they were those that carried the Word of God and rightly explained the Scriptures. They were the holy male men, if you were. But they were just delivering the product. If they were of God and they were lowercase, little apostles, then they would carry out the word of God and they would deliver that truth with accuracy. But if they were false apostles, they would bring something that sounded like the word of God, yet it would have been in error. So they're distinguishing between these two groups. Whichever group they belong to is really inconsequential because they were tried and they failed the test. So when they heard them speak of Jesus, what they said was false. You call yourself an apostle and you believe that? That's wrong. Are you saying Jesus was just a spirit? That's not right. That's not right. Are you saying Jesus was just a man? That's not right. Sister so-and-so slap him. What should have happened, right? You can say amen, it's fine, it's fine. Clearly, the church at Ephesus had a lot going for it. And if you read this passage, you know that's clear. They labored for the gospel. They demonstrated patience, were intolerant of evil people. They even biblically examined those who claimed to represent Christ. 
Folks, when a church rightly practices church discipline, which is what that's talking about. When they rightly practice church discipline as needed, she's doing more for the kingdom of God than most churches have done throughout time. Because it's a difficult thing to do. As I've already mentioned, some who gathered with the local body couldn't be removed. But in verse 3, some of them were successfully expelled from that congregation. Some of them were out. When you see the term preserved, and this is coming in verse 3. When you see that term preserved, that's the same Greek word that's used in verse 2 and was translated bear. It means this. It means to remove or lift from place. To remove or lift from place. The false apostles of verse 2 were at the very least dismissed from their positions of influence or leadership. They were not allowed to stay in them. You know, because this is the way it shakes out in the church today. If we were to do church discipline and say this person did this wrong and they are no longer allowed to do what they were doing, then what we would do is we would remove them from that position. But what would we say? We'd say you can still come and gather with us. Why? Because we want them to hear the word of God. We want them to hear the truth. We want repentance. This is a Galatians 6 model where we go in and we try to restore them in the spirit of gentleness. We try to restore them as a brother and sister in Christ. But they are not allowed to stay in those positions. Dismissing them is the right thing to do. It's for the health of the church. And we don't get it all right. But we try. Godly men and women tirelessly banded together, abiding under the shelter of the Almighty, and were willing to face extreme conflict, get this, for his name's sake. The Ephesian church was dealing with all kind of stuff for the Lord's name's sake, for Jesus' name's sake. Throughout the scriptures, there are dozens of references that relate to actions being taken for the Lord's name's sake. If you simply investigate the Psalms and one from the New Testament that I'll add in, a wonderful picture is painted of the idea of the Lord's namesake. I want to take a few minutes and stress just how precious, how important this doctrine really is. The Lord's name. How many of you finish your prayers and say, in Jesus' name? I have heard Bible study teachers And I have heard pastors say, we don't need to say that. This isn't mandate. I I don't know how you can get away from this doctrine when you start seriously looking at Scripture. If you pray something unbiblical, of course you're not going to do it for the Lord's name. Lord, I pray that this adulterous woman would be my wife. She's still married. I mean, don't, don't expect God to bless that kind of prayer. Don't put his name in the middle of it. But if you're praying something from the word of God, then it's the will of God. And you're doing it for his name's sake. Does that make sense? I'm going to go through some of those passages and just get you to hear the Lord's name. For his name's sake, the reason that things are done. In Psalm, 3, in Psalm 23, verse 3, David wrote this. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for for his name's sake. For his name. God desires for the world to see his people live righteously because through their lives, his name is glorified. In Psalm 25, 11, David again says, For your name's sake. Lord, for your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my iniquity, for it is great. When sin is pardoned, get this, you got to understand that when sin is pardoned or it's forgiven, then God is exalted because he's the only one that can do it. You remember the paralytic that was lowered in? You know, we get to see Jesus being exalted as God because he forgives sin in that passage of Scripture. In Psalm 79, 9, Asaph said, Help us, O God, of our salvation, for the glory of your name. 
and deliver us and provide atonement for our sins for your name's sake. The request there is given because Asaph wanted the Lord's might and compassion to be put on display. He entreated him at the least in part so that the nations might better understand who he is. So that he would be glorified when his might and his power was shown. In Psalm 106 verse 8 the psalmist said, Nevertheless the Lord saved them for his name's sake that he might make his mighty power known. Why did he save them church? To make his power known. He gets glory when things like this happen. This is why it's so important that the church at Ephesus was doing things for his name's sake. In Psalm 109, 21, it says, But you, O God, the Lord, deal with me for your name's sake, because your mercy is good, deliver me. Here David requested the will of God to be present in his life so that he might be glorified and mercy might be granted. The king of the Psalms said this in Psalm 143 verse 11. He said, Revive me, O Lord, for your name's sake, for your righteous, righteousness sake. Bring my soul out of trouble. If he was revived, if David was revived in this situation, then God received the glory. If, if he was healed, then the name of God was exalted. Finally, this principle is beautifully encouraged in 3 John 1, 5 through 7, where the elder apostle John writes, Beloved, you do faithfully whatever you do for the brethren and for strangers who have borne witness of your love before the church. If you send them forward on their journey in a manner worthy of God, you do well. Because they went forth for his name's sake, taking nothing from the Gentiles. So, so the question has to be asked, why would the Ephesians or any of God's people do anything for the Lord's namesake? Why would they do it? Why would it take place? The primary point is not, the primary point is not that they might receive something. These prayers that keep going up and all these psalms and scriptures that were read, it's not so that they might receive something. It's not so that they can taunt the people around them and say, look what I got and you didn't get. It wasn't for that reason. Instead, what we see from the scriptures is deeds are done and prayers are raised in his name so that the world might know who he is. So that the name of God, the attribute of God, who he is, might be glorified. They might understand the character of him. If you understand who God is, if you really get a sense of his character and the way that he interacts with the people that he created, if you know who he is, you want to be closer to him. He's glorified in that. This past Friday night, I had the privilege of fellowshipping with New Life Family Church. And there was a young man there that was, I'm able to say that, over 40. But there was a young man there, and uh, he was talking about what had happened in his life. He said, you know, I was in high school, and I flunked out. I, got, I was getting in all kind of trouble. I ended up getting into a work program, and that didn't work out too well. And finally, I met this girl. And he said, I met this girl, and here's what I did. I finished my education. He said, and this young girl, she, she had me go to church. And I didn't just go to church. I got involved. I didn't just sit. I did. I was active among the congregation. He said, you know, I, I started making money. I was able to pay off bills. And he goes down this long list of things. And then he says, but all of it started to fall apart. And as you're listening to him tell this story, he said, you know, the reason that I did all these things is because she told me to do it. And then finally I discovered that I should be doing things for the Lord. 
And he said, good or bad, whether they succeeded or failed, if it was done for his namesake, he was glorified and I was at peace. That's the point here. The church at Ephesus was doing what they needed to for the Lord's namesake. They weren't doing it for themselves. Folks, if you're doing it for you or doing it for another person that you love and not for the Lord and you claim to be a Christian, you're missing the boat. You do life for his name's sake. I come that they might have what? Life and have it more abundantly. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. It makes me take pause when people say, I've got to get my priorities straight. That may be very true, but Jesus is not a priority. You say, Pastor, you can't say that. You can't tell me that Jesus isn't a priority. He's not. He's not. Jesus never claimed to be a priority. He should not be a priority in any of your lives. Why? Because Jesus is your life. You remember what the Apostle Paul said. He said, for me, to live is Christ. And die is gain. Jesus is not your priority. He's your life. And understanding that truth is one of the things that the Ephesian church had going for it. You say, well, look at all this other stuff. The Lord came and he's rebuking them here. Talking about them being loveless. There couldn't be anything worse. Well, good. Folks, he's going to remove that lampstand if they continue in that way. But as you'll see next week, he encourages them to change the way that they were living. Now, after knowing... Now, after knowing all that you know, it's kind of hard to imagine why the Lord would threaten to remove their lampstand, right? But he would have, and he still does that if a church is loveless. There are a lot of preconceived notions about what it means to be loving I'm going to encourage you in the next week on your own to go and to research in your own copies of Scripture and define love as God did, not as you want to. And I'm going to give you a hint. Love is not the 11th commandment. I'll quote Vody for this one. You are not commanded to be nice. Now, I understand that it is an attribute that seems similar to kindness and it should happen. But that is not the love that is talked about in Scripture. So go back and do your research. And when we come back together next week, it's going to come full circle. You're going to say, I'm looking at this and I'm seeing this in an entirely different light. This is why the Lord was threatening to remove their lampstand. They did a lot of good stuff, but if this one thing wasn't in place, they're going to have to be taken out. As I say every week, God created everything that we have in a beautiful picture. Um, God created every sunset. He created every storm that comes in. He created you and me in the air that we breathe, and without him we would have nothing. And until the person recognizes their true need in Jesus Christ, he will not save them. You can live a life and be around Christ and not be in him. I promise you, I've seen it too many times. But the person that recognizes their need in Christ understands not only that they don't want to go to hell, But life is so much better with him because he is the life that they need. I'll tell you the result of somebody that's born again. Hear me on this church. The result of somebody that's born again will be after salvation. Repentance of sin and faith. Turning from sin which leads to a turning in behavior and Trusting in the Lord, having faith in what he said in his good book. 
That's what it means to be born again. Today, if you've heard the message, uh, we are obviously not doing the altar call the way that we have or the invitation the way that uh, the invitation the way that we've done it for so many years because of what's going on. But I encourage you to pray. Uh, just speak to the Lord. Uh, do your business while we sing this closing song today. And if you'd like to speak with me afterwards, we will social distance appropriately in my office after the Q&A. And, you know, uh, we'll discuss whatever you need to discuss. Let's pray. Great King, I thank you uh, for what you revealed in your word, and I pray that it would not land on deaf ears. I pray that those who have ears to hear would hear and would take it to heart. I ask, Father, that someone struggling that hasn't truly known you as Lord and Savior would be brought to salvation today, that things would just make sense for the first time, not because they are trying to make them make sense, but because your Holy Spirit pulls back the veil of darkness and presses them into the light. Thank you, Father, for all that you've done. I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.